Hello and welcome to our worship for today, Sunday the 5th of July 2020. As always, let me begin with a few um, announcements to bring. The first one is to say a huge thank you to everyone who has been able to contribute uh, to the Food Bank Nations over these past few months, especially uh, during lockdown. Uh, we were told on Monday past when we took our uh, latest contribution that we have been able to donate over 1,000 kilograms uh, during lockdown. The Food Bank are delighted with this and thank us very much for all that was given. It'll be a break uh, for those donations now until the depot reopens again uh, at the start of September. Just a reminder to say that new members classes will more than likely be going online over the summer. So if communicant membership is something uh, that you want to think about or you want to explore or you have any questions about it whatsoever, then please get in touch with myself and we'll plan to run those over the summer. So that whenever we're able to share the Lord's Supper again, we will hopefully be able to welcome some uh, new communicant members into to our midst. Um, with a date now in place for us to return to the building here to worship together, um, I'm going to take a couple of weeks of annual leave. And so that will mean that the next two Sundays, uh, you will be in the capable hands of our moderator, uh, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, uh, David Bruce. He also produces and, and puts online a service of worship each Sunday. So we'll be using that with a couple of uh, local announcements uh, just beforehand from ourselves. And then the final one uh, is to say that as it was announced last week, we are planning to return here to the building and to have services again on Sunday the 26th of July 2020. Uh, in the, the, the time coming up to that, we're going to write out to everyone in the congregation. So hopefully over the next week or so, just depending on the post, uh, you will receive a letter to let you know a little bit more about that. We're also in the process of putting together a video which will show a walkthrough of what you can expect from the moment that you arrive at the front of the building until the moment that you leave after the service. And that will be online over the next week or so and we'll have that as part of our announcements in the videos in the next couple of weeks. But there are a couple of things just that I want you to know and want you to, to be reassured of in the meantime. The first is that we will be able to ensure that two metres of social distancing is in place for everyone. Uh, between downstairs and upstairs in the gallery, we will have capacity for everyone who wants to attend for at least our, our normal uh, numbers that come on a Sunday morning. On the way into the building, there will be an opportunity for you uh, to sanitise your hands and also again um, on the way out. We'll put measures in place so that you don't have to touch or handle things and um, the likes of Bibles, um, hymn books uh, and the collection plates. We'll be doing things a little bit alternatively to ensure that you, you don't uh, have to do that. One thing I would say is please do uh, arrive in good time. Please plan to arrive maybe at least 10 minutes before uh, you normally do. That will allow us to be able to facilitate the flow of people in uh, and then obviously on the way out after the service um, uh, as well. There'll be a one way in and there'll be a one way out uh, system that we will uh, adhere to. And as I said earlier, downstairs and upstairs will be available uh, for seating. So that will more than likely mean um, that you won't be able to sit in exactly the same pew uh, that you normally do. But we, we hope this won't be forever. Uh, and we know that it's a, a small price to pay for being able to, to meet to worship again uh, once more. Uh, and the final thing I wanted to say is that you can have confidence. You can have confidence to be able to uh, return here. Confidence in those things that we've put in place uh, and some of the other things that you'll see on that walkthrough video. This will be a safe place to be and you can have confidence uh, as you plan uh, to return. Worship services, whenever we do return to the building, will all be recorded on a Sunday morning and we plan to upload those online around Sunday lunchtime. So we know that not everybody will be able to return uh, straight away, but you can still see and take part uh, in the same thing that everyone else uh, will be as well. So please do take a look out for that this week uh, and in the coming Sundays, uh, a flavour of what to expect whenever we return from the 26th of July onward. Our call to worship this morning comes from Revelation chapter 4 and it's a glimpse of heavenly worship, of worship in the, the heavenly realms. Let me read that for you as, as we come together to worship now. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him, he sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. 
the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Amen. Let's come together to prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, as we begin our time of worship for this morning and, and for this week, we stop and we pause. We pause to, to take in just how worthy of our praise you are. Just how worthy you are, our Lord and our God. Father, you are the one who has created every living thing. You are the one who has created us. Lord, we live and move and have our being because of you, because of the one who has made us. You're the one who's created the heavens and the earth. You're the one who is mighty and powerful. You're the one who radiates splendor and majesty and authority. Father, that picture from Revelation 4 gives us that glimpse, gives us that sense of worship in the heavenly places. And Father, we want to come now and to lay our crowns before you. Father, even though we are still scattered, even though we are in different places, even though we are most likely in our, our homes watching and listening to this, Father, we pray that you would help us not to take this opportunity for worship lightly. Father, help us not to take this as, a, as an overly casual thing. Because Lord, you are the one who is worthy. You are the one who is worthy to receive glory and honour and power. You are worthy to receive everything that we can bring to you. You are the one who is holy, holy, holy. The one who is perfect, spotless and sinless. You are perfection. You are holy, 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 the Lord Almighty. And Father, at the beginning of our worship together today, we, we confess our unworthiness. We confess our unworthiness to be able to come into your presence at all. Father, we know only too well the sin that is within us. Father, you know those things that we have heaped praise on. You know those things that we have bowed down before that are not you. Those things that we have metaphorically left our crowns before, Lord, and worshipped and given ourselves to. Father, you are the one who knows the depths of our unworthiness. Father, as the hymn writer so eloquently put it, Lord, you are the one who is able to plumb the depths of our disgrace, of all that we are, of those things that we've thought, of those things that we've said, and those things that we've done that are far from pleasing to you. Father, we confess our unworthiness. And yet, Lord, as we come before you, we, we come thankful. We come thankful that even though you're holy, 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 even though you're the Lord God Almighty, because of Jesus, because of his perfect, spotless righteousness that becomes ours when we believe in him and trust in him, Father, you welcome us in. You allow us to come into your presence. And you allow us to meet with you. And so, Father, help us to come with this attitude of bringing all that you are due. All that you are worthy of. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible handy, then please do turn with me to Luke chapter 12. We're going to begin to read at verse 13. So it's Luke's Gospel and chapter 12. We're going to read from verses 13 to 21. It's the parable of the rich fool. So Luke 12, beginning at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, that is Jesus, teacher, Tell me my brother tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he then told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Amen. And we thank God for his word. And we end our reading there. Well, one of our members uh, in Alexandra, Jason Syme, works in Greystone Road Presbyterian uh, in Antrim. So he's a, a communicant member here, but we, we don't get to see him uh, every Sunday. But he has uh, brought for us this week the Kids' Corner. So I'm going to hand over to Jason now. Hello, boys and girls. Um, I just want to start this with a short reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And that says... I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Now I know there are loads and loads of big words in that um, and you're probably wondering what a lot of those mean um, but your parents would be able to get something out of this reading as well. But the one verse I want to focus in there is a little bit of verse 4 and that tells us that God wants all people to be saved. So let's say that again, God wants all people to to be saved. Now I remember that because we're going to come back to that a little bit later in this talk. But first, I have a question for you, and I know you can't answer me right now, but just think about it. Do you collect anything? Have a think about some things that you might like to collect. Maybe ask your parents if they like to collect anything, or maybe they liked to collect something when they were your age. Maybe your brother or sister or friends like collecting things. Lots of people like to collect stuff. Some people collect stamps. Some people collect certain toys. Some people might collect football cards, um, but I want to show you some of the things that I have collected over the years. Now, the first thing I want to show you is this. This is a box of Pokemon cards, um, which I got when I was eight years old. Um, and you'll see I still have them. Now, the box is a little bit beaten up. Um, if I take my thumb off here, they'll probably fall out the bottom. But if I open it up, um, we'll have a look at what is inside here. Um, there's the cards, you can see they're actually in pretty good condition. Um, I'll show you the front of a few of them here. Um, there's some there, look, they look really good, don't they? Um, there's the one that's on the box, I think. Um, you know, these aren't bent, they aren't scratched or anything. I'm just noticing this, there's one of these little discs missing, so that tells me I have played with these at some stage. Um, so I got these when I was eight. And I still have them. I don't still have them because I like to play with them. Um, I don't like to play with them anymore. Um, but I kept them because they remind me of my childhood. They remind me of the things that I enjoyed doing when I was eight. Now I could probably sell these online. And because they're in such good condition, I would probably be able to get a fair bit of money for them. Um, but I think I'd rather keep them. Even though I'm never going to play with them, I think I'd rather keep them because I think it's a good story to tell. I think it's good for me to find these and say, look, this is what I enjoyed doing when I was a kid. And don't take it from me because you can actually see the stuff here. The next thing I want to show you comes in a big box. Okay, big, massive box. Uh, just looking at that box, you can probably tell what it is. Now, anyone who knows me quite well will know two 
big things about me. The first one is I am a massive Liverpool fan. Um, and I'm not just saying that because we've finally won the league. You know, I've suffered through lots of hard years of supporting Liverpool. But I'm a massive Liverpool fan and I really like my trainers. Now, in 2017, three years ago, Liverpool Football Club turned 125 years old. And I can guarantee you now, you don't know anyone who is 125 years old because that is really, 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 really old. But in 2017, Liverpool decided to release some trainers to commemorate their 125th anniversary. Um, so this, these are them here. Um, you can see, look, the nice cool Liverpool badge on it. If you look inside, I'm not sure if you can read it, but it says 125 years on it. And there are the dates. Um, just the other shoe, just so you can see that I actually do have both of them. Um, one thing you would notice about these, if you look at the bottom, they are really clean, aren't they? Now, I've never, I've never worn these trainers. I've never worn them outside anyway. I have tried them on and they do fit. Um, but I wouldn't want to wear them outside because that would get them all scuffed up. Look how white it is around the bottom. I want to keep those nice and clean. Now, I think that if I was to wait another 22 years and Liverpool were celebrating their 150th anniversary, I could probably sell those for a lot of money. But I don't want to do that. I want to keep those because it's a nice collector's item for me. Um, it's two things I really enjoy put together, trainers and Liverpool Football Club. And I get to look at them and think, that's cool. That's, that's something really, really cool to have. And it's something really cool, I think, to show off. It's a funny story about how I managed to get them as well, because they were sold out online. And I was only able to get them because my uncle happened to be in Liverpool the day they were released. So I think that's a really cool story. And I think it tells a little bit about me, actually. Now, I know you might think, how can you collect it if it's only one thing? Um, but, you know, you don't need lots of things to be able to collect something. You, you might just need something that you want to keep and keep in pretty good condition. So that's the second thing. Now, the third thing I have here is another item of clothing. Um, I'll show you it here. Um, it's a hoodie. Okay, if I can open that out. You see it. There's the hood, um, there's the front of it. That's my name on it actually, Jay Syme, and there is a badge. Now you're probably thinking, what is that badge? This was the badge of my school. Okay, you can see what it says there. It says class of 2010. And if you look at the back of this hoodie, you'll see a big number 10 on it there. Um, and the really special thing about that number 10, I'm not sure if you can make it out, um, but everyone who was in my year group their name is on this and their name makes up the number 10. So there's about 130 names on that there. Now, I don't wear this hoodie anymore. I probably only wore it a few times when it was new anyway. Um, but in 10 years, I've never thrown it out. And the reason I haven't got rid of that is because it reminds me of my time in school. I can look at the names on it and I, I can say, Oh, I remember that guy. He was really, really friendly. He was really, really cool. Um, and it helps me remember the friends that I had in school, even those who I don't get to talk to anymore. And that brings back some really, really good memories for me. So they are just some of the things that I have collected over the years. Now, for some of these things, it's just one item, but it's a thing that I will never throw away, even if I don't use it anymore. That's because it means more to me than the thing it was designed for. Now, the Bible tells us that God has made each and every one of us unique and special. And that's just a fancy way of saying different, but different in a good way. So we may want to be like other people sometimes for certain reasons, but we have to remember that God made us the way we are for a reason. Which brings us back to the little bit I read at the start. God wants all people to be saved. Say that with me. God wants all people to be saved. He doesn't just want the people who are brilliant singers or the people who are brilliant at sports, or the people who seem really, really smart. He wants all of us, because he designed us, and he made us, and he wants us to spend eternity with him. So some of the items I've shown you may not mean much to any of you. Some of you may not even understand why I like them so much, and that's okay. But this is a bit like us with God. God loves us no matter what, and wants all of us to follow him. We may not feel good enough sometimes, and sometimes we may not understand why God loves us so much, but we just have to know that he does. Don't let anything stand in the way of you loving God, because we know that he loves us, we know that he loves you, even though we are not perfect. 
So let's pray now. Lord God, I thank you for making us who we are. And I thank you that you want all of us to be with you, even if we sometimes feel we're not good enough. Thank you for loving me, Lord. Amen. Thanks to Jason for leading us in our Kids' Corner this week. Well, let's come together now to bring our our prayers for others, our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Father God, as we meet together in this way today, we want to come and bring you our prayers for our world. Father, we want to think especially of those who are in authority over us, those at a local and national and a world level, all of who have have had difficult waters to navigate through recently, have had uncharted waters to lead um, us through. And Father, we pray for those who are responsible for making decisions, those which affect day-to-day lives, not only during uh, times of pandemic like this, but as life would return to to some form of of normality in the weeks, the months, or maybe even the years that, that are ahead of us. Father, we pray for authorities right across the world, those maybe in powerful, influential nations, which affect not only where they live, but but have a knock-on effect right across the world. Father, we pray for those who have responsibility for making laws which do affect us, whether in Northern Ireland or, or across this United Kingdom. Father, we pray that their desire would be to do what is good, not necessarily what is popular, to do what they, they feel and they know in their heart of hearts is that the right thing and not maybe things that, that will gain them popularity or, or maybe even a greater slice of the electorate as time goes on. Father, we pray too for justice, for those who are being treated unfairly. Father, for those who are in difficult situations, we pray that governments and governance and laws would would take into consideration those who, who seem to trouble or seem to be in trouble because of, of how the world operates, because they are unable to, to make progress. They, they feel unable to, uh, to make progress themselves. Father, we pray too for our community. Father, we thank you that you are the one who works justice for the oppressed, as you remind us in Scripture. And so we want to pray for those who, at this very moment in time, are oppressed. Those who are oppressed by addiction. Those who are oppressed because of a lack of stability in their homes. Those who are oppressed because of joblessness or fears for the future. Those who are oppressed because of how they are treated by someone else. Father, we pray that you would give a voice to the vulnerable you would give strength to those who are fearful and anxious father we pray for those who seem to be stuck in a cycle of poverty or a cycle of continuing to make the the wrong decisions father we know that you're the one who can break those bonds we know we know you're the one who can rip off those chains that people feel ensnared by And Father, we pray that you would help us as a a church, you would help us as a a church family to play our part in, in Lord, being a a light in dark places, Lord, reflecting the the very light of the world. Help us, Father, we pray, to step up and to see opportunities and to be able to take them. And finally, Father, we want to pray for those who, who have suffered because we have not been good at keeping your commandments. Father, over these past number of weeks and months, we have thought about your law. We've thought about the commandments and how they summarize how you ask us to live as your people. And Lord, we rightly confess that that we in some ways have probably broken each one of these. So we want to pray for those who have suffered because of this. Those who have suffered because of our words. Those who have suffered because of our actions. Those who have suffered because... We want to keep or take things for ourselves uh, at the exclusion of others. Father, we pray for those both locally and, uh, and across the world who have suffered because of our inability to keep your commandments, our inability to follow what you have told us and commanded us to do for, for the, the sake of others. 
And so, Father, we want to bring these to you, our prayers, these prayers for our world, these prayers for our community, those our prayers for others. We want to bring them before you, and we want to trust in your goodness. We want to trust in your sovereignty and your plan for each one of us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we do come to the final part in our series as we look together at this 10th commandment. And at the start, I said it would be good if we were back before the, the 10th and the final commandment. And, and we are almost there. We, we almost uh, made it back in, into the building before then. But we look together at this uh, final commandment. And as we do so, we find it again in Exodus chapter 20, this time in verse 17. Let me read that for us. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. This 10th commandment obviously brings a close to the the commandments themselves, but it brings to a conclusion that the second section of the commandments as well, which is that that we are to love our neighbours as ourselves, as Jesus himself summarised. And if the first section of the, the commandments could be described as being our, about our relationship vertically between us and the Lord, well, the second part of the commandments are about our relationships horizontally, aren't they, between us and our neighbours. And until this commandment, we could probably say that the harm we could potentially bring in the second part of the commandments was to someone else, was to another. Honour or otherwise our parents murder or harm our neighbour, adultery and the harm we can do to our marriage, stealing or taking things which aren't ours, giving false testimony, lying or speaking in ways which harm other people, the harm of another, the harm of someone else. And today the 10th commandment deals with our relationship with each other, yes, but I think it's fair to say that the consequences of not keeping this commandment does more harm to us than it necessarily does to our neighbour, than it does to another. Why? Well, because we can covet without our neighbour or anyone else really ever knowing anything about it, can't we? They can live happily with their lives unaffected, maybe even oblivious to what really is happening right in here inside of us when we covet. And yet as we covet, as we break potentially this 10th commandment, it's us that it eats away at, isn't it? It's us that it has an effect on. And what is happening when we covet? What does it mean to covet? Well, it's all about our strong desire for something that we don't have. Things that we don't have, things that other people have, things that we just think would make our life better better or maybe even complete and the commandment walks us through the sort of things that this happens with doesn't it it walks us through the the different scenarios and the different possibilities our neighbor's house well imagine imagine what i would do with the space that they have imagine imagine how happy our family would be if only we had a garden like theirs wish we lived in an area like they do What about our neighbour's husband or wife or relationships? Look how how much happier they are than us. Why doesn't my husband or why doesn't my wife look after themselves like he or she does? Or anything else that belongs to our neighbour? You know, I am sick of driving a car with the oil light constantly coming on. Look at the car they have. Look how shiny it is. Look how new it always seems to look. How much more straightforward would my life be if it was as comfortable as theirs? The commandment walks us through different scenarios, doesn't it? If only I had, then my life would be so much better. You know, whatever we fill that blank in with, that is what we are in danger of coveting. That strong desire to have something that another person already does. 
And this, this tenth commandment helps us to see that it can be any number of things, doesn't it? Someone else's house, someone else's relationship, anything else that someone else has that we fix on, that we really, really want and can't stop thinking about until it's ours. And that's how a strong desire takes hold, isn't it? We see something we want, we imagine ourselves having it, and before we realise it, we, we think we are really missing out because we don't have it. And that's the... That's the key thought there, isn't it? That we are missing out because we don't have it in our lives. And you know, whenever we stop to think about it for a minute, isn't that what a lot of marketing is all about? Isn't that the way in which things are advertised to us so often? That you need this or you're missing out. Look at this perfume. Look at this aftershave. And just look at the sort of man or woman that it attracts and could attract for you. You see, when you drive a car like this, it really will complete your family. It really will tick that last box for you. Or if you have a car like this, well, well, do you know what? It really will bring you the power. It really will bring you the respect that you have always craved. And when lots of different things are advertised to us, it's often with that undercurrent, isn't it? It's often with that unspoken message that you are missing out until you have this thing. And for us to desire something, for us to covet it, we have to feel that we're missing out, don't we? We have to feel that we're missing out until we get it for ourselves. And you know, in our world today, in our culture today, in 2020 and and beyond, it's easy to do that, isn't it? It's easy to have our minds filled with these things. It's easy to do that because we live in a world that makes us 24-hour long consumers. How many of us are working away on a laptop and we maybe we just keep one extra window open with Amazon or eBay or Curry's or something else in, in the background? How many of us follow that link from uh, the email on our phone or our iPad or tablet which, which takes us to our favourite shop and well sure we, we might as well just have we look we'll just have we look when we have five minutes spare or how many of us sit at of an evening with the iPad or the phone or the computer on our knee just constantly scrolling constantly window shopping we tell ourselves and that's often how it begins isn't it we see the next thing that we set, set our hearts on if only I had it if only I had that, our life would be so much better. And you know, for most of the commandments that we've looked at, we've we've turned to a passage where Jesus um, speaks about it. We've seen how Jesus uh, addresses some of the commandments directly. You have heard it said, but I say to you, is often the pattern that Jesus follows, isn't it? And today in the passage that we read together there from Luke's Gospel, well, Jesus isn't dealing with this commandment directly or specifically like he, he did with the others on the Sermon on the Mount. But what he says in the parable that he shares is completely spot on for this 10th commandment. Because we picked up the, the reading just after Jesus was teaching on important eternal things in Luke's gospel. Things that are hidden, he says, well, one day they will be known. And so Jesus speaks about important eternal things. And then a question comes blurted out from the crowd. Hey, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell him to do it, Jesus, because he's, he's wronging me. Tell him to do it. Sounds a bit like a, a childish playground squabble, doesn't it? Give me what's mine. Tell my brother that's not fair. You know, it sounds a bit like that, but in many ways, it's, it's probably not an unreasonable plea. He probably has been wrong, this man. And so the problem is, is not the value of his inheritance. The problem is not the value of what he has missed out on. But the problem is the value that this man puts on his inheritance. He puts enough value on it that to shout out this question at probably quite an, an inappropriate time after what Jesus has been talking about. But how does Jesus respond to this man who shouts out from the crowd? Well, he responds with a warning against greed. Or as the ESV and other translations put it, coveting. He warns against coveting. Jesus warns against the same thing, the exact same thing that the 10th commandment prohibits. 
Something which can eat away inside of us. Something that it sounds like it was eating away at this man. And Jesus, well, Jesus reminds us that, that our lives, they don't equate to the sum total of our possessions. They don't amount to what we can gather up for ourselves. And then he follows that up with a parable. He follows that up with a story which really gets to the heart of what he is talking about. And the parable shows us how this plays itself out in our lives. In this story, in this parable that Jesus gives us, well, a man has been blessed abundantly. The ground produced a good, good crop, we're told. But it's not the ground that's been good to him, is it? It's the Lord. The Lord and his sovereignty has produced this good crop for the man. God has been good to him uh, and the crops that he has, well, well, that's evidence of it. In fact, he had so many crops that he literally didn't know what to do with them. He didn't have enough room to be able to store them all. That's a pretty good problem to have for any farmer, isn't it? But it wasn't the problem that was this man's problem. Having too many crops wasn't the issue that Jesus wanted to make here. But it was the man's solution that was the issue. His solution was that he would build bigger barns to store it all in. He would tear down what he had and he would build much bigger barns. And this man's plan, the pattern that he lived by, it gives us a helpful insight into coveting and how it works itself out in our lives. How did it work itself out in this man's life? Well, he thought his possessions, he thought his stuff was the real source of satisfaction in his life, didn't he? What does verse 19 tell us? I'll say to myself, that the man in the parable thought, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat and drink and be merry. See, this man, this man thinks that he has finally found the route to satisfaction in life. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry, he tells himself. Sounds like a, a pretty satisfied soul, doesn't it? Doesn't get much better than that. But... But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will, demand, will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? You know, Charles Spurgeon, a preacher from 200 years ago, hit the nail on the head. And I think I've maybe shared this before, but it's, it's so on the point. Spurgeon says this. You say, if only I had a little more, I would be satisfied. You make a mistake. If you're not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. Isn't that true for all of us? The nature of coveting means that, that we can never be satisfied. There will always be something else we want. There will always be something else we don't have. Because that's how it works, doesn't it? That's what we tell ourselves. Like Spur Spurgeon says, just a little bit extra, and I'll be happy. Just the latest version of, and I'll be happy. If such and such was just better, I would be happy. But you know, while our contentment depends on things or people or possessions or stuff, while we look to these for our satisfaction, well, our hearts will never be truly satisfied, will they? What else did this man think bigger barns was, was going to, to, to give him, to provide for him? Well, he thought it would provide security for the future. Verse 19 tells us that, that this man would satisfy himself knowing that he had laid up enough for what? For many years. The man in this parable was satisfied with himself because he thought he could sit back, look at his barns and say, ah, whatever comes my way, I've got enough. Whatever happens, I've got plenty for years to come. The problem was this man <clears throat> just kept thinking about himself, didn't he? The man in the parable referred to himself eight times in total. I, I, what I'll do, I'll say to myself. And this constantly thinking about himself, well, it means he, he, doesn't, he doesn't allow himself to think what God has blessed him with. He doesn't allow himself to reflect what God has already done, what God has provided for him. And maybe what he could do with that. How he could give things to people who are hungry, to those who have no home, to those who have no provision. He doesn't stop to think about those things because he, he's too wrapped up in, 
and thinking about himself. He's too wrapped up thinking about his satisfaction and his security that it leads him back to the same point every, every time. It leads him back to himself every single time. What is the alternative then? If this is what it, is, if this is what it me is means to covet, if this is what it looks like to constantly think about things that we, we don't have, well, what is the alternative? What is the way out for us as followers of Jesus? Well, the opposite of coveting is to be content, isn't it? As followers of Jesus, we have every reason to know that we can be content. Why? Well, we can be content because we know that we are cared for and we know that we are provided for by the Lord himself. Because real contentment, Jesus reminds us, comes from knowing that God meets our needs. See, immediately after this parable in, in Luke 12, Jesus turns around and he addresses his disciples. He speaks to his followers. And this is part of what he tells them in, in the first half of verse 23. He says, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. Or, and then later in verse 27, consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. You now Jesus gives the illustration of help, helpless things. Things like little birds, things with, like flowers that grow wild, things that don't have the capability of plotting or scheming or producing or building barns like this rich man. And what? And yet their needs are met, Jesus says. And Jesus reminds us that if helpless things like these have their needs met, how much more valuable are we? How much more valuable are you? How much more valuable am I? How much more valuable are we as God's image bearers? And that's what Jesus says. How much more valuable are you than the birds? If this is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You have little faith. You know, whenever we begin to stop looking at what others have, and whenever we stop coveting what we feel will satisfy us now or give us security for the future, then Jesus reminds us we can find a different way to live. As followers of Jesus, there is a true contentment that we can find. And ironically, it's often when we don't have our provisions stacked up in bigger barns or bigger bank accounts or ices or whatever else, Ironically, it's in those times, isn't it, that we look to the Lord more quickly and we look to him more often. When we realise just how much we rely on him, well then we're more inclined to be rich towards God, as Jesus goes on to say, say here. It's then that we start to give more of ourselves to him. See, through this parable and what Jesus teaches afterwards, he's saying that there is an alternative. There is an alternative to what the 10th commandment warns us against. Instead of feeling that we have to accumulate things that will satisfy us or give us a flimsy sense of security, we can be content. We can be content to know that the Lord provides. And in return, well, in return, we can be rich towards God. We can give him the best of our time. We can give him the best of our resources. We can give him the best of our energy knowing that he will meet our needs, knowing that we can trust him. When we, do that, we'll, when we do that, we can invest in what will last. We can invest in what will last for eternity. We can invest in God's kingdom with ourselves. You know, the bottom line in this parable and in this 10th commandment is that it leads us to look inwardly, doesn't it? It asks us to ask difficult questions of ourselves. And different people that I've spoken to throughout this series on the commandments, well, well, that has been a recurring theme. A theme where God's word challenges us and makes us ask questions of ourselves and our lives. And it's been a reminder, hasn't it, that whenever we come to read God's word, whenever we stop to take it seriously, 
Well, it reads us too, doesn't it? It reads our lives. It's a mirror that's reflected into how we live. The choices that we make and the things that we do. But it's important, it's important to finish this series just uh, as we started it. It's important for us to remember that the commandments haven't been given as a set of regulations in order for us to be able to win God's approval, in order for us to be able to earn God's love. That's not what they're about. And yet, if we're honest, that's sometimes the trap that we fall into. That's sometimes the message that we take away, either from the series or or from the commandments themselves. But let me say one final time. These commands were given to already rescued people. The first people they were given to, they had already been rescued from their slavery in Egypt. The Lord didn't come and present these commandments as part of a bargain and say, if you live these well enough, well, maybe just maybe one day I'll save you. It's not what happened. The Lord had already rescued. He had already saved. He had already set free. And then they were given to rescue people. Commandments given to rescue people so that they might know how to live for their God. So that they might know how to live for the Lord. And that's what they are to be for us as well. As followers of Jesus. Given to people who have already been rescued. People like us who have been rescued from the consequences of our sin. People like us who have been rescued from being slaves to sin. Rescued people because of Jesus. Because of the one who lived and died and rose again. To rescue us from our sins. And they have been given to us so that we might know how to live for the Lord, so that we might know how to live for him, and we might know how to live with him. Let's be challenged by God's word, and let's be changed by God's word. But let's also know that as we repent and put our faith in Jesus, well, we are rescued people. Rescued people who want to know more of how to live with their saviour. Our closing praise will will appear now and it it will help us to reflect on the fact that Jesus is our saviour. Join in with that. Use that as an opportunity of reflection to know that the Lord is with us. Amen.